most scientists dismissive of all the evidences of paranormal phenomena which really prove overwhelmingly in my view that we that we live in a multi-dimensional universe like i consider there to be significant scientific evidence for ESP, psychokinesis, pre-sentience, sure. out-of-body experience, ghosts, poltergeists, all of these things have been documented for hundreds of years. There's so much, not only evidential, anecdotal evidence, but also scientific investigations. So I think the case is overwhelming. I think it's been made. We just haven't been advanced enough to develop models to explain, okay, how can this be working now? And that's what we need to do now. Isn't it a shame that it just seems to be escaping science? Well, I think it's almost intentional in a way. I think. Really? Yeah, I, I think it, it's these skeptics are. I think we have a new form of what I would call new think, and it's almost like an intentional effort to undermine the value and significance of religious or spiritual teachings, and offer us this what I would call pseudo scientific view instead. So I think it's almost intentional, and it's kept out of the school. It's like Dean Radin says in his book. He says, you know, in the world there are maybe 50 people, scientists investigating paranormal phenomena, but it's like the most, one of the most profound areas of psychology, whereas you have thousands of psychologists investigating trivial little issues in different parts of social psychology or personality theory. Everyone ignores the most critical issues. It's almost like there's been a... Um, you know that the church used to prevent prevent the advancement of science, and then it's like scientific certain dogma became established in science, and they prevented the investigation of these areas. I mean, the CIA and people like this are more interested in it because of its possible applications. I mean, a lot of the Stanford huh. research and such, it was done by intelligence agencies. Absolutely. Yeah, but it was kept out of the, you know, they. it's like you don't want it in the universities. People might be interested in it. <laughs> like, I, I don't, on my site, I, I did an internet survey last year of 13 Canadian universities, and I wrote each university a letter saying, is there anyone in your department who teaches teaches anything of mystical or spiritual psychology or studies paranormal phenomena or researches consciousness. I bet you I, probably got almost zero. I got zero. I there know. wasn't one professor out of 600. There wasn't one mainstream course on those subjects. But from my view, like those are the most profound essential issues of psychology. But it doesn't, it doesn't fit into a behavioral paradigm, so it's been ignored, and that's why I think science has made such fundamental mistakes. How important for you to understand all this uh, was your training as a uh, forensic psychologist, let's say? Um, well, absolutely against everything I've learned. In fact, everything I learned in the mainstream of modern psychology, I now regard uh, as wrong, fundamentally mistaken. Like, psychology de today is defined as the science of behavior and the mind. They have no psychology of the heart and soul. They have the complete wrong understanding of consciousness. They have the wrong understanding of the nature of self. They don't think we have a self. They think the self-experience is produced up in portions of the cortex rather than there being any self within the heart. So I see the whole mainstream modern psychology is fundamentally mistaken. And, and I, I believe the body is ensouled um, through the action of the heart, through the infusion of soul energies into the blood and it's related to the process of oxygenation. Your soul is connected to breathing. Like um, in Genesis, God breathes into man a living soul. So, you, so the heart and soul action are both connected to what I'm saying is your true self, this heart center in higher dimensional space. Okay. It, it, there's a physics to it. You know, it's a complex subject, but I've tried to introduce aspects of it. See, most we, we want to learn to live in the consciousness of the heart. So as you go about your day, try to remember to come back to being present here now, wherever you are, and connect with your breathing. Your soul life is connected to your breath. There's four levels to your breath and four levels to your soul. So when you come back, just being present and connect with your breath 
and I tap myself over the heart space sometimes so I can feel that brings my attention to that area and try to experience yourself being in your heart your heart space is empty in ways in the way there's in mystical teachings there's a form of nothingness at the heart of being in a way there's a vacated space within your heart this is described in Kabbalah and Judaism there's a hollow within the heart so in a way we want to center in the heart so I actually tap myself over the heart and try to be centered in my heart space and the mystics say Self-realization, which is the attainment of the next level of awakening, involves the disillusion of the false mind into the lotus of the heart. So more and more, you, in a way, the, the turning of the mind is an obstacle to consciousness. You want to lessen or still the turning of the mind and learn to be more centered in your breath and, and tap yourself over the chest, try to feel awakened in your heart. And remember yourself... I practice self-remembering, meaning as I go about my life, I make efforts every day to be waking up here and waking up there to try to increase my wakefulness and, and build on that. I was listening earlier how you were saying how the heart uh, connects with the mind and to the spirit. I had a heart transplant two years ago, and I was curious why I went, to, if that's the case, why wouldn't I have noticed a lot of changes? in my mind and thinking and whatnot. Yeah, well, I think your, your memory is really in the sub, more subtle fields, information fields, um, that the, the heart, um, yeah, it's not in the, the actual matter of the heart, but it's in the subtle fields that interpenetrate the heart. So your memory is in this deeper the uh, field information so even though your heart might be replaced i mean there are a lot of paranormal experiences that people have with heart transplants did you have any of those type experiences such like have you ever read uh, sylvia uh, brown's book called the change of heart no uh, well you might look at that uh, and it's reported um Picking a number of people of have traits. written about this all people where someone receives someone else's heart but, and, but they have experiences that connect them to the donor or visions of the donor or they, it changes their own psychological makeup. She's one lady who's written about this. Uh, it's discussed also in the Hearts Code by Paul Pearsall. But it's a good question and, and I don't, I mean, I, I don't really want to pretend that I understand all these mysteries. You know, I'm still an explorer and trying to understand it. It's a good question. Why don't, why doesn't changing the heart then change our personal identity and memory? And I'm saying it's because that is more established in the zero point fields. And that, the material heart is changing, but the deeper, the psychical heart is, is still your own psychical heart. You know, there have been some incredible stories, Christopher, of people who have had transplants, organs, of course, from uh, people and who have passed on in most cases. And people generally take on either their personality or get some sights. You know, it's been made into a couple great movies. Yeah. But it's very strange. Yeah, it shows in the way that the heart donated by someone still seems connected to the soul life of that person. That's what it suggests. And it happens with other organs. I mean, sometimes change, I think kidney, transplanted kidney, it can affect your food preferences and things. We, we don't really understand the memory, um, where memory is stored. In a way, memory seems inherent actually to matter, like within matter. It's like where you, you're having Sheldrake on tomorrow. He's a, a, mm -hmm. such an important theorist. and, and Actually, His model is like there's this group mind, and that's in the subtle field. So the memory is really in the subtle field. It's not that memory is recorded in cell assembly somewhere in the brain. It's more that it's inherent to within the nature of matter. By the way, that book, A Change of Heart, it's Claire Sylvia. It's Claire Sylvia. Not Thank Sylvia. you. See, I think creation is projected around the central point out of the physics of light within this vacated space in the heart and reality is spun around that it's hard really to explain it um because it's a very complex kind of subject so the difference between see i think our reality is projected around the central point 
Explain that. Explain that. And it's our we're lit up from within, within, without. Explain that. Um, well, see, it's like Blavatsky says, the zero points are the materials by which the gods and other invisible powers clothe themselves in bodies. I say at the core of your being, you have a zero point center, and around that, that's surrounded by different bodies which um, are created out of the quantum vacuum due to the spin properties of your monadic essence. I mean, I haven't had time to... I believe that we have a monadic essence that exists in seven-dimensional hyperspace. And this has certain spin properties, and the spin properties of that monadic essence is like a Kalubi-Yau space in modern physics. It, it creates material bodies surrounding that central point. And, and it's the interaction of light emerging from within that illuminates the matters of these different um, bodies. I'm saying that really the heart has different dimensions to it, okay? That the physical heart, psychical, spiritual, and then the ultimate divine element within the higher dimensions of the heart. So although a person might have the physical heart replaced by a mechanical device, it's still within the space of the heart. Like the so essential it's actually heart not center. The is what so I would not, call the bliss sheet, which is... So it's not the heart you're talking about, it's the area of the heart. It's like the center the center of chi. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's in the physics of the zero-point fields. Okay? And, but that sustains the heart. Normally, your own psychical heart ensouls your, phys your physical heart. But if, a, if your, the heart's removed and you have a mechanical device, it your psychical heart is still there. It would be very interesting to examine the feeling qualities of people who have had a mechanical heart inserted. It likely takes some time to feel their feelings as fully for a while. Yeah. But it, I imagine that would be restored, though, over time. I don't know. I would, that would be my expectation. So what you're saying people, is... See, in psychology, people don't today even think you feel feelings in your heart. They think you feel feelings up in your head, in the limbic system. They don't... There's no psychology of the heart. But how many people go and tell your loved one, you know, I love you with all my head? <laughs> you know, people don't... In a way, we know we feel feelings in the heart. There's no understanding of how that actually okay. works. I'm a psychologist and a clinical psychologist, and, and then I worked in prisons for 12 years. Um, so I have experience in the forensic uh, legal settings and in courts and, and detention centers and so on. Um, so that's my background, but my lifelong interest has been in the psychology of consciousness. And I'm interested in the science of it and the science of, of the, the mystical teachings. Um, when I worked in prisons, I was able to apply and develop a new model of offender rehabilitation based on this work. Because today in, in corrections, the main approach is cognitive behavioral. And the idea is that you alter the cognitions to effect behavioral change. But see, in all of modern psychology, there is no psychology of the heart and soul. So I developed something called awakening of consciousness and the heart in criminal offenders because I think this, the root cause of criminal activity is the deadening and restriction of the heart and that people lose their essence feeling in the heart and that's when they turn to violence and, and have such other life issues. Some of the things that you have worked on, I mean, do you believe that there is life after death, Christopher? Yeah, I believe we live in a multi-dimensional universe, yeah, that we have different bodies, we can exist um, in different planes and afterlife realms. And in a way, your afterlife conditions are determined by your psychological makeup, because it'll tend to correspond to your current psychology. What do you believe that afterlife is? Another dimension? What, what's the process? Um, there, there are other dimensions at different um, vibrational frequency ranges within the zero point. Tell me a little bit about the Institute for Mystical and Spiritual Science, part of Zero Point. 
Um, well, mainly it's myself, and, and, and you know, <laughs> I, I have six books. I, I've worked at these for 30 years. I continue to refine them and, and develop new material. I have my website. I, I give talks and seek opportunities. Uh, my, my work, I would say, is relatively unknown. You know, I don't have a major publisher yet. Um, and it's just my, I'm really dedicated. I think science, modern psychology is so off base with such fundamental misunderstandings. And I think we need to try to synthesize a, a more progressive understanding of science with the ancient mystery teachings. I accept the existence of paranormal phenomena. I've had numerous paranormal experiences through my life. And so, you know, I've striven to understand what these things are. That's why I've been drawn into this area of study. Many unknowns, eh? really just about human history and our origins and extraterrestrials. There's just so many unknowns. Well, and the greatest unknown, of course, Christopher, is the universe. And whether there's multi-universes or just one, multi-dimensions or just what we are in, uh, it's it's very perplexing because I think it all leads back to some kind of intelligent design. It yeah. just doesn't happen by accident. No, I absolutely agree. I, I think there's, I believe in intelligent design, that there's creative life principle. And I mean, I believe that, that not only there's intelligent design, but it's actually that design manifests the formula the one is divided by three to give seven. Just like the, the Godhead has a triune nature and creates seven planes of being. So the one, three, seven principle, I think, is a fundamental principle of intelligent design that's evident in all phenomena of nature. Does physics prove any of this? Well, I mean, take the physical world. What's it composed of? Protons, electrons, and neutrons, three, part, three types of particles, and seven rows of elements in the periodic tables. Okay? And maybe a few more we don't even There's know one, about. one, three, seven. Take light. Divide light by a three-sided prism. Gives you a spectrum of seven colors. Hmm. See, they're both examples of the one, three, and seven. If you look at particle families in physics, there are three main particle families hadrons, leptons, and gluons, which are the messenger particles. It's three main um, families of particles. Each of those exists in three dimensions. So really, yeah, again, it's the, these laws of three and seven, I study these in the area of science because most scientists always think dualistically, like they think there's matter and energy. Well, now in the new science, there's not only matter and energy, there's also information which is latent within the medium. So it's called third force science. Dean Radin talks about this. It's called third, and Talbot does. It's third force science, that information is latent within space. So whereas we always saw things dualistically, now we're arriving at the idea of the triunity of nature. Okay, your website, of course, is zeropoint.ca, because you're in Canada, zeropoint.ca. I've been doing a lot of, actually, I've been doing a, um, a series of reviews. To explain what I teach, I'm starting to do critiques of other people's work to contrast my own work with their, like I'm um, so doing other, a other... critique of The Secret, I'm doing a critique of Down the Rabbit Hole. Oh, tell me hole. about your thought of The Secret, because that's a hot movie right now. Well, I think there are elements of value in it, but I, I mean... To consider that that is the secret uh, is Don't completely fanciful, secret. and there are far deeper secrets. In fact, it, most mystical teachings, they're concerned with how do we get beyond this level of reality created by all these attractions and repulsions, like how do we get free of this matrix of creation? And in a way... Um, well, do you think it was well done? Did it get the message across? We, um, you well, got, got different messages. I think there's far too much focus that it's just our thoughts that create reality. Like, I, I see us as three-brained beings. We function mentally, emotionally, and physically. Okay, so 
like to create your own reality is not just a matter of thinking and conceiving it it's also the emotional aspect of it because the thought is given form within the heart in kabbalah the heart is that which gives form to the attributes so it needs to be a combination of the thoughts and the emotional center and then also the physical action so i think for people to manifest things you want to you know it's the thinking feeling and action all three components the fellow on oprah stressed that and, uh, when he spoke of the secrets he, he called the, he talked about the th threefoldness of the process in other ways i thought the um movie focuses far too much on kind of materialist goals and enhancement of ego and money and you know status and such rather than uh, mystical goals which is really surrender of the egoic nature to realize your deeper self uh, and that's a far more deeper and secret process of everything you've studied so far Christopher what to you seems to be the most mind-boggling just very not necessarily perplexing or puzzling but almost something you look at in awe what might it be um, the kind of model, in terms of ideas, well, the, the Blavatsky's concept of zero points and, and this idea of how, um, how we come out down out of higher dimensional space, like to understand what that really means, not just in words, but to also understand it somewhat in your experience and being. Then there's the ladder of Jacob, a Kabbalist sim symbol where you string four trees of life together. In a way, that, that ladder of Jacob is a, is a model of the structure of the quantum vacuum. That's essentially what it is. It's a model of, of the h higher dimensional nature of space. So some of these mystical symbols, as you understand them, they're profoundly valuable. And in a way, you can experience aspects of this. I've studied the making holograms, and what doesn't seem to be brought forward is the aspect of the viewer's unique perspective of that whole, or that the person's unique perspective of the universe might be due to their heart resonance frequency, or like you were saying, like the zero field that's unique to them. And when you make a hologram, there's two different kind of basic types. There's transmission and there's projection holograms. And again, yeah. people don't really refer to or bring that aspect when they talk about the holographic universe. And I kind of think, you know, that's the difference between uh, projection and transmission when we're kind of talking about psychology. And I was wondering if you want, had a take on this, and I'll hang up and listen off the air. Thanks. Well, no, hold on. And, and hold on. Still there? Like, uh, interesting uh, yeah, question. Sorry. And one thing in response to Talbot's book and the holographic paradigm in general is that most of the people who use the holographic paradigm don't think there is any interior source of coherent light like when you do holographic photography you have a point a laser light and that provides a source of coherent light now Carl Friedman says there are no laser beams in the head no none of the holographers think that we have an interior source of coherent light so when well, I say the there's coding. a diva atma within the heart, this is a source of coherent light, which is the basis for creating holographic experience. Yeah, That's not in Talbot. Out, Talbot place, also doesn't have to... this concept of there being a coherent light source. Now, I haven't well, I really answered your question, but I, I want to bring that up. Sorry. Oh, no, no, the other part was the transmission and projection holograms, like, like yeah. psychology. Um, see, I think creation is projected around the central point out of the physics of light within this vacated space in the heart and reality is spun around that it's hard really to explain it um because it's a very complex kind of subject so the difference between see i think our reality is projected around the central point 